all of you that are um, joining us now in the meeting and for all of you who are watching us live on YouTube. I want to just share a few things before I turn it over. Um, my name is Ann Louise Worthlin. I am the one who has been blowing up your email inboxes with mm -hmm. um, updates and additional information for our summit. I wanted to let everyone know that um, for the morning sessions, everyone, um, if you are a participant, you are going to be muted and we will not be able to see your video, but we please Please hope that you will use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen where you can submit questions and uh, comments up to the presenters and the panelists. Um, my team and I will be collecting um, those questions and if they're not answered live, then we will make sure that we get those answered by the panelists um, at a later date. We also are going to be collecting um, any resources that we learn about and, and ideas and concepts that come up today and um, synthesizing all of that information and sending that out to you all next week. So um, if you hear Hear something that sparks an idea or if you want to share a resource in your area um, again please you can use the Q&A for substantive questions and then also use the chat function to share that um, Again, I just want to thank you all for being here today. Um, we were very overwhelmed with the response we received, and uh, we believe that this is just a first step in an ongoing dialogue um, to keep, um, to, to, excuse me, discussion going and um, keep bringing new faces and new perspectives to the table to help um, solve the evictions crisis here in Tennessee and prevent people from being evicted. Um, before we dive in, um, we do have a, a poll that I would like all of you to participate in. So um, Jared Walker, if you can please uh, share that for us. We just want to get a, a picture of, who, of who's in the room, uh, quote unquote. Normally, you know, in, in other times we would be doing this in person. So please go ahead and vote. Um, we've got uh, not quite half, so if you keep voting. And once we get a, a majority, we'll share those results. So you can see who's in the room. You can see um, the presenters will be able to see who, who they're speaking to. And we can get to know each other a little bit more. So we've got about almost 80%. So if you want to, um, we'll keep it open for about 15 more seconds. So why don't you go ahead and vote if you can. Okay. All right, that's been about a minute. So um, let's go ahead and end that poll and we'll share the results. So you should be able to scroll down um, it, on your screen to see there were um, 10 options. So you'll see that we have um, we have some landlords. We have one tenant. Thank you for being here. We have um, some judges and court clerks and court personnel, um, some attorneys, state and local government, um, nonprofits. There are lots of nonprofits. Glad to have you at the table. Um, we have some mediators, um, law school representatives, and then we had another category just to um, capture anyone who did not um, identify themselves as being in one of those other roles in evictions. I'm going to stop sharing those poll results. But... Um, and then I want to uh, to turn it over quickly to pass the mic to our AOC director, Deborah Taylor Tate. Um, she's really the reason why we are here today. This was her um, her brainchild, uh, and uh, my team and I just made it happen. So she recruited many of you all uh, who are going to be presenting for us this morning. And um, I, again, we just would not be here without her today. And I'm going to um, turn it over to you, Director Tate. Thank you so much, Anne Louise, and welcome to everybody. This is exciting. I told Anne Louise I actually put on high heels today and lipstick. <laughs> um, I'm the director of the Administrative Office of the Courts, and some of you work with us every day and partner with us on all kinds of exciting, innovative solutions. But beyond the administrative responsibilities for over 2,000 judges and court staff, uh, we also, through our Access to Justice Committee, Mission, the Tennessee Supreme Court's number one initiative, are in the business of identifying and solving problems as early in the court process with automated forms, mediation, and even now online dispute resolution for medical debt, a new pilot. 
Um, Justice Connie Clark will close today, and I want to thank her for her unparalleled work so that people indeed do have open access to justice. Through pretrial diversion and assessment, our safe baby courts, recovery courts, veterans courts, and even a new pre-petition family preservation court, judges are becoming really active as community leaders and are in the business of connecting people with needed services to prevent further court action and to find solutions. So for those of you in health and human services, you know that this is the part of the sequential intercept model that starts way, way back at zero. A few weeks ago, today was just a really brief email to an old friend of mine who happens to be the director of THDA, Ralph Perry, who will be talking in a moment, asking if he might have some interest in helping co-host. And for anybody who knows me, that is code for, will you pay for a summit? Um, and, um, you know, as we're all aware, the governor declared a state of emergency last March and the Supreme Court quickly followed with a state of emergency for the entire judiciary and suspending most in-person hearings. The court did not suspend contract or the rights to rents owed, but merely for health reasons, in-person hearings. And then the eviction moratorium was lifted here in Tennessee. However, at almost the same time, the CDC issued another order of moratorium through December. So if you're confused by all this, so am I, so are most attorneys and most judges. Um, and while we do have a fabulous group of legal experts to walk us through some of these challenging times, the purpose of today is really to say, how do we prevent people from getting to that process? And certainly, how do we prevent them before eviction? How do we prevent all the negative and potential uh, disastrous impacts? Not only clogging the court system, but also landlords who are not being paid and families who become homeless. All of this we're trying to deal with while dealing with a pandemic. So hopefully today we'll change the conversation from what the legal process is to how do we insert resources and assistance now rather than later. So back to my original email to Director Perry. I'm not sure how many minutes it took him, but the response was immediate and a resounding Yes, of course. So our staffs, Jim, Jeremy Hyde and Ann Louise, whom you've already met, set about scheduling today's conversation with all of you all. And in a few days, we had surpassed our wildest expectations with more registrants than the platform could handle. So we upgraded to a new platform and now we're live streaming it for those who couldn't be registered. Then I reached out to another friend, Commissioner Danielle Barnes, whose entire legacy may become known as Next Gen Solutions, preventing the next gen of poverty and dependence by strategically and collaboratively building lasting and sustainable supports to assist families becoming truly economically independent. So together, I hope that we're bringing stakeholders that we all know, but maybe they haven't ever shared a conference room before. Let me know that while our uh, flyer said the first eviction summit, I know some of you all may have said that's just not the case because I know you've been toiling in these vineyards for a long, long time. But maybe it's the first time that the courts have been at the table. Today, we hope to connect all of you all who are in court or in the process of going to court with alternatives such as mediation. Did I say free mediation right in your community and legal services? Did I say free legal services right in your community? In addition, our faith and justice partners have provided safe, out of court venues for solving problems. We have trained over a thousand faith leaders to try to recognize civil legal needs before people go to court. Specifically, the incredible expungement clinics that churches, neighborhoods, and even schools have hosted that have allowed our citizens to return to work and become productive 
taxpaying citizens. So maybe an outcome from today is a template for an evictions workshop, a prevention of eviction workshop. Perhaps they become broader problem solving, one-stop shop clinics where we're all there together to solve whatever the problem that our citizens are facing. We see the broad interest there is in all of these issues by the number of people who have joined us today. So we hope in, instead of an eviction summit, it becomes a solution summit. Our two first keynotes are well known to most all of you all. Mr. Ralph Perry oversees THDA, Tennessee Housing Development Agency, the state's agency that administers millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of HUD funding. I think I'm right that, Ralph, you're the longest serving director since 2012. Ralph and I have partnered on recovery housing for moms and children, independent living environments since the very first Families First Act 20 years ago. I know Ralph from his years of public service, and he has a keen eye for a broader ecosystem, precisely what all of you all represent today. He is a bureaucrat, but he's also an innovator with a big heart, who's an excellent steward of taxpayer dollars while seeking to find solutions that improve citizens' lives far beyond just housing them. And after Director Perry, we will hear from Commissioner Daniel, Daniel Barnes, having first been appointed by Governor Bill Haslam and now by Governor Lee. That in itself is such a tribute to her acumen, her skills, and collaborative approaches to the next gen solutions that I mentioned. We, the court, have a number of partnerships with DHS that you all may not even be aware of. So many issues that are facing Tennessee families. We together fund child support magistrates, grants for visitation for children and parents, victims assistance, mediation, and legal services. She oversees over $2 billion in funds, directs 4,000 staff, and has helped 2 million families. And like Ralph, the commissioner is a problem solver. We know you all have Zoom fatigue. Goodness knows I do watching courts all across 95 counties. We know that you're juggling multiple issues, but we hope that today we'll cross all geography, counties, cities, branches of government, and empower families to find the supports that they need. As Anne Louise said, we hope this is a first step to addressing the evictions crisis in Tennessee. Place yourself today in a different position. Try to put yourself in the position of a small business or an individual landlord who relies on their rental income to pay their mortgage and feed their own family, or a tenant who just lost two jobs and can't pay their rent, or the child that has lived in three homes and gone to three schools in three months. All are being victims of these unprecedented circumstances and faces decisions that none of us would want to face. So today is about prevention and solutions. And by the end of the day, maybe we'll have a few action steps on our list. Maybe somebody will want to follow up on my evictions workshop concept. So with that said, I welcome you all and take it away, Director Perry. Thanks very much, Debbie, and good morning, everyone. Uh, you, you were awfully kind in that introduction, Debbie, and I appreciate it, though I, I rather prefer the, the, the title of public servant to bureaucrat. And I hope that our partners and friends who, who work with us find us anything but bureaucratic in our approach. But all of us at the Tennessee Housing Development Agency are proud to join with you, with Tennessee's courts, and our colleagues at the Department of Human Services to address the housing-related hardships that result from the COVID-caused economic shutdown. Of great concern to all of us are the many thousands of Tennesseans who have lost jobs or a significant portion of their income, and with it, the ability to pay rent on time and in full. Earlier this week, the National Council of State Housing Agencies, the NCSHA, released a report noting that in the last four months, fully one-third of rental households did not make on-time payments. At some point, that puts those households at risk of eviction. And if you've read Matthew Desmond's book, Evicted, 
you understand the cascade of harmful impacts, financial and emotional, that befalls those who lose their homes through the eviction process. The NCSHA report puts the number of Tennessee households at risk for eviction within a range of 220,000 to 310,000. It estimates the amount of unpaid rent owed to Tennessee landlords at between $457 million and $599 million. We know that a great many landlords are working with their tenants during what we hope will be a temporary hard time for them, but not all of them can afford to do that. Nationally, almost half of rental housing is owned by small investors, some with only a single rental property. And those mom and pop landlords don't have the deep pockets or financial backstops that larger entities do. The eviction moratorium helps renters, but it leaves those small landlords at great distress. And frankly, the help offered to renters through the moratorium really only amounts to buying time. When the moratorium lifts, as it will, renters will still owe the amount of back rent plus any fees and interest that have accrued in the meantime. What I think we'll talk about today is what we might jointly do about all of this. At THDA, we have about $33 million in Federal Emergency Solutions Grants, ESG. Some of those funds are being used to support organizations that house the homeless. The funds can also be used to assist low-income renters who are in imminent danger of eviction. Now, ESG is available only to those earning less than 50% of the area median income. It's only part of the problem. Intake agencies will be able to use the ESG funds to make catch-up payments for those renters to head off eviction, but only as the renter is in imminent danger of eviction, like within 14 days. That's a very tight time frame for a lot of them. And ESG is a reimbursement program, and agencies have to spend their own money first before they can get reimbursed. And we're finding that very few of our partners in this program have that kind of upfront cash. So THDA is working both with HUD and with Tennessee's Department of Finance and Administration to see whether we can't allocate ESG funds on the front end to cover those costs. And failing that, we're working on a backstop where we might use THDA's funds for that purpose. Still, there is no immediate assistance for COVID impacted renters who make more than 50% of AMI nor are there resources that takes the pressure off the thousands of small landlords who frankly depend on timely rent payments from their tenants to cover their own expenses. There are some steps we can take together to mediate and mitigate the housing related hardships of thousands of Tennesseans, folks who were good tenants and timely rent payers until the economy collapsed earlier this year. I thank the Administrative Office of the Courts and Debbie, your leadership in particular, for pulling all of this together for us today. I look forward to the conversation and to our work together. And with that, it's my pleasure to hand this off to my friend and colleague of longstanding, the great commissioner of Tennessee's <laughs> Department of Human Services, Danielle Barnes. Well, gee, Ralph, no, uh, no pressure in that at all. But I do have to say, first of all, just thank you all. Uh, all of you out there in Webland for joining us today for this very important discussion on eviction prevention. We've been very fortunate in the state of Tennessee and we are now at a point where we need to come together. I will tell you when I first started this job uh, three and a half years ago, one of the first calls that I made was to Director Perry. And I asked him and I said, we serve so many of the same customers. There are things that we can do to help our, uh, our insecure with housing, not necessarily homeless, but those that are right there on the cusp of eviction or those that are right there that are trying to figure out what their next stable housing solution would be. We knew that those partnerships were going to be so important. And then I reached out to my good friend, Debbie Taylor Tate, and I asked her, I said, what can we do? And she, if you all have met this woman, you know that she has solutions and she's coming. So when she called and asked if we would be willing to partner, we gladly jumped in. Now we know that right now it's an unprecedented time and trust you me, I'm about as tired of saying that word as you all are of hearing it. But we know that it is unprecedented. Tennesseans, right now are 
more so on the verge of facing evictions due to COVID-19. And historically, there's not always been a clear path forward of where to turn to in this time of need. We've forced our citizens to traverse through several different sectors, including various state agencies like DHS and THDA. Uh, we've asked them to go to local governments and public housing authorities, nonprofit -serv non service providers, the legal community and the court systems. And what's exciting today is that now is an opportunity for us to really come together, for us to pull all of those resources together and for us to learn from each other. So I hope today that you will not only learn about the resources that are available across the state, but also generate ideas for how we can better partner across these sectors to prevent evictions and ensure that all Tennesseans can stay safe and healthy during this time. Now, you all may have heard me say this and it's a terrible thing to say, but it's true. Never let a good pandemic pass you by. And this has been the innovation, if you will, behind our service delivery model in the Department of Human Services. I think it's important to note, and you heard uh, Debbie Taylor Tate talk about our two generation model, and we have been very intentional about providing that whole family support. Since my tenure, we've been very intentional about collaborating with our community partners. We know that government cannot do this alone. And we know that if we know who those government partners and community partners are, we know that we can truly create a seamless experience for our customers. We know that we are changing the way that we are doing business. We are no longer asking our citizens to come and sit in our offices and fill out paperwork. We know that we've been able to take advantage of this particular pandemic by bringing so many of our online services up very, very quickly. We've been able to do telephone interviews. We've been able to stand up programs that have been able to assist Tennesseans in ways that we never thought that we could do and in a time when they never thought that they would need us. And the reason I bring all of this up is because these services need to be blended. We need to be able to have these resources available to help not just our citizens, but we know that this is support during eviction prevention as well. We're excited to share and highlight those resources with you all throughout today's event. This afternoon, uh, the DHS team is hosting a breakout session that will discuss the resources that are available through our TANF program, which some of you all may have heard about, the Temporary Assistance to Needy Families, and SNAP. Um, and we've done a lot of work in both of these areas as a result of both the tornadoes and the pandemic. We've also seen an increase in our roles, again, because we've experienced such high unemployment. We know that this may be a short-term solution for some of these folks, but we also know that some of these folks are gonna need more wraparound support to continue to move to the next level. The session will also be uh, discussing some of our partnerships and some of the things that are happening around the state. I think it's important to note that DHS partners with several organizations to provide rental assistance and wraparound services through our 2Gen program. Our community services block grant, our CSBG, which you all will hear us call them. Uh, and those are generally funded community action agencies. And more recently through the Tennessee Community Cares. And I think you all have, have heard a bit about a, this program as well to assist those nonprofits during COVID-19. These community partners serve low-income families through grants provided by our department through our TANF program and through the CARES Act funding received by Tennessee. Now, when I talk about partnerships, I think it's important to realize that these partnerships are real, that they are actually providing measurable outcomes. And there's just a few I wanted to share with you. And I, want, I hope that you'll get excited about them and join in the conversation a little bit later. But one of these programs is a partnership that we have with Methodist Le Bonner, and that is our Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. And that was, it is a program that is dedicated to creating a health and safety, safe home environment for low income individuals and families by promoting a more coordinated, comprehensive approach to delivery of health, healthy housing services. When we think about the work here, it's important to know that in one particular situation, we helped a family get out of an unhealthy 
living situation, provided the family with a food box, assisted the homeowner with gathering, gathering necessary documents for the Habitat for Humanities application process, and moved the family from a, uh, a situation where he needed a new roof and HVAC and had lead, and is now living in a home that is his and is stable for his family. That's the kind of work that we are doing across the state of Tennessee, and that's what gets me excited. Another one of our partnerships, and I think you'll hear from today, is the uh, United Way of Greater Nashville. And this was one of our pilot programs that we're continuing to watch and have been partnering with them since 2017. And this program assists low-income families at risk or who are experiencing homelessness. I think it's important to note that since 2017, our partnership with the United Way has yielded services to over 1,300 families and prevented over 500, almost 600 uh, families were prevented from homelessness and housed over 600. This is real work that is being done in our communities. And then finally, I'd be remiss knowing that we have so many lawyers on the phone if I didn't mention our partnership with the Tennessee Alliance for Legal Services. And we call them TALS, you all know TALS. They provide legal assistance and connections to wraparound services to low-income families through a partnership with DHS known as Cycles of Success. This program was launched in 2016 and it helped uh, initially just those families in Shelby County. We expanded that this year to include additional families in Davidson, Hancock, McNary, Hardeman, Scott, and Morgan. And we're continuing to grow that program. That um, program this year has served nearly 100 clients across the state. So as we lean forward today, as we engage in conversation, I want you all to really talk about and think about what can I learn from another agency? What can I learn from another participant? What can I hear or glean as something I didn't know? Because what I hope you understand and one of the things I hope you hear is we're all in this together. We know that we are in an unprecedented times. We know that our families need our support. And you know that you've got people that are here because they want to be part of that conversation. I appreciate the opportunity to take part of this conversation. I appreciate the opportunity to partner with you all across the state of Tennessee. And I really hope that together, we really begin to build a thriving Tennessee. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here today and for your leadership. I'm just very grateful that you are able to join us this morning. I hope you all be able to join us throughout the day. Um, now we're, as you all know, we have a lot of information packed into a short time. So I wanna quickly turn it over to our next presenters. And again, please use the chat and the Q&A if um, there's something that you heard specifically that you want more information on. We will make sure you get those questions answered and um, make sure you get the information that you needed. So um, the next topic we're going to hear about is the CDC moratorium. That was something that was very frequently requested when people registered to learn more about. So I want to turn it over to um, Katie Ramsey Mason. She is the assistant professor, professor, excuse me, of law and the director of the Medical Legal Partnership Clinic at the University of Memphis School of Law. And then also Cindy Eddinghoff, who is the CEO and general counsel at Memphis Area Legal Services. So Katie and Cindy, won't you take it away, please? Right, thank you. Thank you. I am just in the process of getting the screen share up. And hopefully everyone can see that. Ah. Okay. Whoop. So, um, Thank you all for joining us today. It's really wonderful to see um, as many people who are interested in this issue from a variety of different um, uh, fronts, um, because you know evictions, as you know the the earlier speakers pointed out, is not something that is um, just a legal problem. It's not something that's just a tenant's problem, and it's not something that's just a landlord's problem. It's something that is affecting. Um, our, certainly our legal system, our social services, and um, our, our 
a, a large part of our economy. And so um, Cindy and I are going to talk um, uh, somewhat briefly if, about some of the legal developments that have happened um, over the summer, really since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and we're also going to talk briefly about the CDC's moratorium. There is a breakout session also this afternoon um, that we'll be covering that as well, that two um, law students from the University of Memphis and the University of Tennessee will be um, presenting as well. Um, and uh, we'll do our best to, to uh, answer questions as we're able to, um, but as Anne Louise pointed out before, we'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll try to follow up if we're not able to get all of the questions. You may start. Sure. Okay, so the CARES Act sort of um, provided the initial protection for tenants and it was different than the current CDC order. The CARES Act, placed the onus on the landlord to complete a declaration that said the property was not involved, was either not CARES Act property or that the landlord had complied with the CARES Act. What we know is that the CARES Act was in place through, through July 24th, but after July 24th, it also provided a notice requirement. And so there was a 30 day notice requirement that meant if you were going to evict, when the moratorium itself ended on the 24th, you had to provide 30 days notice as of the end of July 24th. So what we were seeing truthfully is that the date that the notice period would end, um, after the following week, we started to see a few evictions filed and that number had increased. We'd see a few more filings each week up until the time that the CDC's order was involved. What we also know is that when we were looking at the initial filings, while the CARES Act was in place, there were a fair number of cases that we discovered that were filed illegally, that the cases were in fact covered. They were CARES Act properties. And when we were speaking with the attorneys, what we discovered is that the attorneys had asked the property manager and the property manager had perhaps not been in a position to fully investigate or didn't really even understand what they were being asked, but said, oh no, this is not a CARES Act property. And the attorney went ahead and filed to evict based upon the assertion of the property manager. So in that case, at least as, uh, some of those cases, we were able to communicate with the attorney, point the attorney to the uh, position of, okay, these cases are actually CARES Act cases and those attorneys were willing to dismiss many of those cases. What we're concerned about, of course, is that we did not find all of those, we didn't catch all of those, or some of them we simply didn't know about until it was too late. So when we get from the CARES Act, it's ended, and as of September 4th, we of course have the CDC emergency order. Yes, um, thank you, Cindy. So um, just to emphasize, um, one of the major differences between the CARES Act moratorium and the CDC's moratorium, um, the CARES Act moratorium um, applied to approximately 28% of properties around the country. Um, so it was, of course, a significant number of people and number of landlords who were affected. Um, but the CDC's eviction order, which went into effect on September 4th, um, is much, much broader than that. Uh, I, the estimates that I've seen um, say that it probably applies to about 86% of tenants uh, across the country. And so uh, many of you may be familiar with the broad strokes of the CDC's uh, order. Um, it did, it was announced by the CDC on September 1st, um, published in the Federal Register on September 4th, which is when its effective date was. And it is currently set to expire on December 31st of this year. Um, unlike the CARES Act moratorium, uh, the CDC's order applies not to properties, but to tenants, which actually means that that's one of the reasons why it's so much, it covers so many more people than the CARES Act moratorium did, because it doesn't distinguish between different sorts of properties that tenants are living in. 
any rental property with an eligible tenant, presumably the landlord who owns that property is prevented from evicting the tenant um, if they qualify for uh, the protections. So, um, however, uh, again, the onus for demonstrating the coverage under this order is, is on the tenant as opposed to the landlord. So again, another difference between the CARES Act moratorium and the CDC's order, which is currently in effect, that the landlords had to assert um, under the Tennessee Supreme Court's um, order uh, regarding the CARES Act that their property was or was not covered under the CDC's order, it's the obligation is on the tenant to assert whether or not they are protected under this order. So the, the requirements of the order um, uh, or the requirements for coverage under the order are um, uh, basically fivefold. Um, so one is that um, the tenant has experienced substantial loss of income. Uh, and it actually doesn't distinguish whether that income loss needs to be due to COVID or whether it's something else. Because um, the way that I read the CDC's order is that there, it's not specifically, uh, of course it is a, me a measure to try to contain the spread of the virus, but it's not intended only to protect people who have been directly impacted by COVID. It's intended to prevent people from becoming homeless or entering into an overcrowded housing situation. Um, it, regardless of whether or not their income loss was actually due to directly to a COVID related reason or not. Second, the tenant has to certify that they are going to earn less than $99,000 for calendar year 2020. Um, that's for a single person, um, $198,000 if they are filing a joint tax return or that they uh, were eligible for the economic impact payments um, that went out as part of the CARES Act back in April and May, um, or that they were not required to file income taxes in 2019 um, due to having such a low income. Um, so that, that's the income requirement. And again, that's why this is so broad. Those 14% of tenants who don't, uh, who are not covered under the CDC's order, um, most of them are not going to be covered because they don't meet the income requirements. Um, but of course, we know that most tenants across the country tend to be on the lower end of the economic um, uh, spectrum, and so it's going to cover, you know, a lot of people uh, just based on their income. Third, a tenant has to certify that they have tried to obtain all available government assistance for their rent and housing payments. Um, it's, uh, there is a little bit of language in the order as to what exactly that means, um, but certainly I think it's also open to interpretation. Um, next, um, they have to certify that they would become homeless if they were evicted if they would either become homeless or they would have to move into an overcrowded situation um, and that they don't have anywhere else uh, that they could live. And then finally, they have to agree that they will pay um, reasonable payments based on their own particular circumstances to the landlord as much as they can um, while the moratorium is, or while this order is in effect. Um, so obviously, um, I did see in the in the Q and A that there was um, you know a question about the impact on landlords. I think. Oh, sorry, let me go back to the last slide. I think that um, the uh, certainly it's very significant, and I think that that's one of the um, major challenges about this order is that. Uh, it did not come with any additional allocation of funding um, to assist tenants or landlords um, who are not receiving the amount of rent and probably have not been receiving the amount of rent for um, you know, upwards of six months at this point um, that they are accustomed to or need in order to, um, you know, to operate their businesses, continue to maintain their housing and meet all of their expenses as well. And so uh, hopefully there will be some sort of congressional solution to this. We're going to talk about that um, a little bit, but, um, but that doesn't appear to be immediately forthcoming. And so, um, but I, I, I just wanted to acknowledge that it certainly is a problem that, um, you know, that, that many people on all sides of this issue are facing and dealing with. Um, and this one has a hammer on it too, right, Katie? Because yeah. unlike the CARES Act, the CARES Act did not specifically provide for punishment 
in the event someone violated the CARES Act. There is, there are very specific provisions uh, for violating the CDC's moratorium. And they are, are quite costly for an individual. It's $100,000 uh, unless the eviction leads to death, at which time that doubles to 200,000. The number goes up if the evicting entity is an organization. So unlike the CARES Act, there are a number of things here that make it more perilous for a landlord to violate it. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And so, and um, the, as far as I'm aware, that's an untested um, uh, <laughs> systems, at least, uh, at least to my knowledge in Tennessee. I think that, um, you know, I think that it, it remains to be seen, um, you know, how vigorously uh, the, the Department of Justice who's charged with enforcing those penalties um, actually would, uh, would proceed with them. Um, we, I'm sure that we will see some efforts um, to make that happen, but as far as I'm aware that that hasn't um, happened at least in our state yet. Um, one question that I'm seeing in the Q&A is um, if the losses are not directly related to COVID, why is the CDC involved? Um, <laughs> So the, I think that's a very good question. Um, the justification that the CDC gives in the text of the order, um, they actually spent quite a bit of time uh, in the text of the order uh, and trying to answer that question. And their position uh, appears to be that the, um, that the displacement of people from housing, from rental housing, um, is a significant enough factor in the spread of COVID-19 or the risk of the spread of COVID-19 because people who uh, would be evicted would presumably either become homeless and needing to either living on the streets or going into a homeless shelter, or for many people, especially um, people with children, would likely be moving in with friends or family on either a permanent or a temporary basis, but in a way that would likely result in overcrowding and um, in within housing and uh, would not allow for particular families to be social distancing and you know, obeying all of the hygienic recommendations that the CDC has put forth um, for people to try to, uh, to mitigate the, uh, the spread of the virus. Um, Let's talk about some of the questions, other questions too. Have you seen them? Um, uh, yes, I'm looking at them now. Feel free to go ahead okay. and answer. So the CDC moratorium only applies for non-payment of rent. That is correct. The other reasons, uh, vandalism, criminal activity, those would continue to result in eviction. The, um, <laughs> we don't know if the moratorium will be extended without assistance. I would find it difficult, but that's just my personal opinion because I think at some point, and it's my position too, because I'm looking for a win-win here. And that's something that actually I'll be talking about later because MALS is a partner in a program that provides some payments to landlords. But I mean, we're at a point where I can understand because I'm getting calls from landlords who are saying, I'm a small landlord, I cannot afford to keep this person in there. So my, my hope would be that there would be some congressional assistance. We certainly don't know. Um, okay, what else? Um, I wanna to touch on um, the, uh, the, the delivery requirement. I see a question in the chat um, about the delivery requirement for the declaration. Um, so the, um, the so what the CDC's order requires is that the tenant provide the declaration um, stating all of those things that I mentioned before um, directly to the landlord. There's not actually a requirement that they provide it beyond the landlord. Um, although we are seeing that at least in Shelby County, some of our judges are requesting that it be filed as well. Um, the the, the best interpretation that I can give as to whether a landlord can inquire into the truth of the statements that the tenant makes in the declaration is that the order doesn't appear to allow for that. Um, I know that that is an issue that seems to be coming up in courts around the country, um, but according to the text of the order itself, there's no indication that the CDC 
is um, uh, contemplated judges or um, any sort of independent fact investigation as to whether a tenant um, uh, is being truthful in that declaration. Presumably, that's where those penalties that Cindy mentioned a minute ago would come into play, that if a landlord feels that a tenant has falsely signed that declaration, that the remedy would be to refer it to the federal government for investigation. Um, same, I think, would go for a tenant um, who felt that the landlord was violating um, the, uh, the order as well, although um, I think that it could also be raised as a defense in court if an FED case was filed against a tenant after uh, the declaration was provided. I think there's a question about uh, when the lease expires. And you know, if the lease should expire during this moratorium, is that mm -hmm. sort of what you'd like to talk about? Um, I think that there's not a really good, clear answer on that. The, you, know, you could always have the argument that you've got a month to month that can, you know, continues until such time, so long as the tenant is willing to make some sort of payment. Um, but there's nothing that would say if your obligation to the tenant has completely ended that you're required to enter into a new obligation with them. So that's, it's not, the answer is it's not clear. We really don't know. Um, some landlords have felt that they should just continue on, some have not. So we'll actually see what happens with that. We're seeing um, that issue being brought up in actual cases though. So anything else? Yeah, there's one question about is a tenant who's paying nothing um, meeting the requirement to uh, to that states that they are paying as much as their circumstances allow? Presumably, yes. Um, I mean, I think that again, there's not an indication that the that there is the ability to inquire into the truth of those allegations, and so. If somebody signs that declaration and um, takes the position that their circumstances don't allow them to pay anything uh, towards their rent, um, then uh, they would still, uh, they presumably could be answering that question truthfully on the declaration. But it's also difficult because part of the argument is that you're required by the terms of the declaration to seek all government assistance available. Um, and you know, periodically there is some entity that gives out rent assistance. Um, so it, it kind of becomes, what if the person has done none of that? And the answer to the question is we don't know. We do, we believe that as a factual matter, courts should not be in, inquiring as to whether or not the individual has made all efforts, all of those efforts after they make the declaration. We do know, not in Tennessee that I'm aware of, but that in Maryland, the court has specifically gone down the list and said, you know, what other organizations did you apply to? What, you know, what are the sources of your income? What are the nature of your bills? And um, because I tend to be sort of a boots and, uh, you know, on the ground, let's give this a shot. Some, for some tenants, I've been concerned that that question is going to arise and that they're going to be in a position where they're asked that by the judge. And for them, my thought has been, you need to sort of know what your bills are, what your utilities are, um, what your medical bills are, just to have the ability to say something when you're asked, as opposed to being in a position of, of being unable to provide any information. That's right. I know that there are a lot of questions coming in. I know that we're also somewhat short on time and I don't necessarily want to take away from, you know, the other uh, people that are speaking. Anne Louise, would you like us to move on? Um, yes, I do think so. Thank you for being very um, conscious of the time constraints. I do. I know you already I mentioned it, but I do want to remind everyone that there is going to be breakout sessions on this in the afternoon and we're going to record those. This is being recorded as well. And again, we envision this as just being the, the first step in a conversation about these issues. So, um, you know, we we know that there is interest in this, the CDC eviction moratorium, and we will be setting up um, follow up up um, opportunities very quickly on this topic. 
did you guys have anything uh, you want to, uh, um, we wanted to just briefly yeah. mention, um, mm-hmm. that there has been a lawsuit. There have actually been several lawsuits around the country, um, that have been filed again by landlords and landlords, uh, advocacy groups, um, challenging the CDC's order. Um, there has also been one filed in Memphis, um, and um, the plaintiffs are uh, our landlords um, uh, who own, as they they claim in the in the complaint, that they own about five thousand property or five thousand units of rental housing in uh, Memphis and Shelby County. Um, I won't go into a whole lot of detail just because I know we're very short on time. Um, you can certainly find the complaint online. Um, and uh, the uh, again, it's it's unclear what's going to happen next. Um, you know, right now this order is set to expire on December thirty first. Um, whether uh, whether Congress will uh, come up with some other kind of solution um, before that or after that, I think remains to be seen. Um, Cindy, do you have anything else you'd like to add before we? Um, I do not. I think that, well, the only other thing I would add is that not only has the lawsuit been filed, but they've now sought an emergency um, injunction, so to speak. So, and that has not yet been addressed, but it's only, it was fired Saturday, right? So uh, yeah. they, asked, they asked for the earliest hearing possible. So I'm assuming that we will be seeing some fallout from that fairly soon. So we'll do our best to, to answer <laughs> some questions in the Q and A. But thank you. And um, and we are I'm going to be you know saving the Q and A questions. So if there's one that wasn't um, deserves more time um, after the fact, you know we are going to make sure that the panelists who helped with this uh, this topic uh, you know work with them to get some um, you know a good follow up. We want to make sure your questions are answered. Um, thank you so much for our live. I love seeing activity in the Q and A and and the chat. Um, uh, I do want to turn it over to our next uh, presenters. We are going to change a little bit. Um, we, we've talked about the CDC moratorium, um, but now we're going to talk about um, funding and programs. And when we were planning this, we were like, you know, how do you find them and, and how do you get access to them? Those are big questions that many people had. And so we're going to hear from um, Donald Harris. He's the housing program director at the Tennessee office of the um, USDA. And then Cynthia Peraza, she is the Tennessee Housing Development Agency Director of Community Programs. So they are, um, take it away guys, and they are going to wrap up this first uh, morning plenary session for us. Okay, thank you. This is Don, can y'all hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, good, good. Uh, Yes, I'm Don Harris, I'm the Housing Program Director um, at USDA Rural Development. And tell you a little bit about ourselves. Um, We have uh, over 300 properties that serve rural communities across the state. So uh, we are in those small towns, those farm communities here. We don't serve Memphis, Nashville, Chattanooga, those areas. So as you can tell, uh, probably under, um, tell our properties are very small. There's um, uh, more 12 to 18 unit type properties. We do have some 30 size that are 30 larger ones, but like I said, they're there to meet that the, those needs of those communities here. Um, I, let me just say this too before I begin here is that Katie and Cindy, I really wish I'd had you several months ago. You described that perfectly here, okay? Um, I, w- I would like to have with you when I was trying to explain this to our landlords across the state and do that. I mean, uh, excellent pro- a- excellent dis- description. So I took a lot of my program away, but um, what I was going to talk about. But anyway, um, we um, let me tell you how it started. Under the CARES Act in March, we were uh, realized that, man, we have a problem here because these rural communities, that served those chicken processing plants, all those sorts of places, those agriculture were really hit hard at first here. And, you know, they didn't have, you know, a lot of people weren't work, uh, were getting laid off, weren't working here. So uh, our department um, allowed for a moratorium or a forbearance agreement um, to these landlords that we work with. They, all these are private or nonprofit landlords and they could ask for a forbearance agreement w- with us and we give them a 90 day grant on that here, okay? Um, they could apply for that and they would have to pay, pay on their note here. All that could be used to pay their um, property expenses here to keep the operations going. So that worked really, really well. And they could still ask for a forbearance agreement uh, up to December 31st of this year. So that's really helped us a lot, out a lot. Um, at the same time with the, um, the evictions, the, the um, prohibition on the evictions here for um, uh, lack of you know, um, income, whatever, that helped out. So it really balanced out well. Um, 
we, like I said, um, had over 70% of our properties, uh, we have over 300 plus properties, so approximately 220 or so were um, the, were um, uh, granted these forbearance agreements. So we still have a few more coming in um, um, as things change a little bit here, but that has been a huge, huge uh, benefit to us here. Then um, once we got through that, things were stabilized here. Um, and then um, the CDC Emergency um, Procedures Act came in into play here. And that caused a lot of confusion with our owners as well. Like, oh, what's going on now? What is this here? So, um, so we had to work through our owners association and directly with our owners here to try to explain as best we knew what was going on with that here um, and how that self-certification process worked here. A lot of folks, um, uh, it didn't trickle down like it should have here to the uh, local level in terms of the local site managers here or whatever. And that was a learning curve for them here. But I think for the most part, we've um, been able to explain it again and, and work with them, especially some of the smaller, what I call mom and pop owners here, the ones who've been in there for a long time. They may only have one or two properties here. Those are the ones that really we need to get the, the message down to the smaller project. So um, we are working right now uh, with that, that, that that's in place here. Um, and like I said, those 90 day forbearance agreements are starting to expire. So I'm getting a little concerned, like well, how will this affect uh, as they move forward with um, some loss of income. But as I think the country gets back to work here, or whatever, it might hopefully help them a little bit here because we operate on some of these properties such a fine, fine uh, margin line between profit and between be, and, and being underwater on the you know note every um, every month. So we do our best to you know to work with those owners. So, but um, I think like I don't know if anything I can add here. That's you know we, the CARES Act to the CDC. Uh, we have um, like I said done everything we can like I said to get the information out um, and try to um, refer, uh, if there's a problem that comes up, we've had a couple here, try to refer them back to that or go to legal, legal aid here to help them out. Um, I'd like to say, I really appreciate uh, Katie and Cindy. I, I, I'm gonna, I think this is being taped. I'm gonna use this here again, okay? <laughs> so, but yeah, especially on the history. So thank you all very much here, so. Cindy, you wanna uh, talk about THDA? Thank Good you, day. Don. Thank you, Don. Thank you, everyone. And I'm going to be sharing a PowerPoint, so I appreciate um, the introduction. One second while I do this. Wonderful. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Cynthia Peraza, and I am the Director over Community Programs at the Tennessee Housing Development Agency, or also known as THDA. Um, THDA is the state's housing development authority, which means that if there's a project related to housing or affordable housing, we're more than likely involved with the development because THDA was created to promote the development of more affordable housing units for very low, low and moderate income individuals and families within Tennessee. Uh, we also promote the preservation and rehabilitation of existing homes and focus on um, bringing greater stability to the residential construction industry to help assure that a steady flow of production of newly housing is made available. In community programs, uh, we administer multiple federal and state funded programs that offer grants and forgivable loans to help communities and individuals with a wide range of programs. So this includes everything from new construction development of homes, multifamily units, uh, unique affordable housing projects. Uh, we also fund habitats and provide assistance to low-income homeowners for repairs, uh, emergency assistance, weatherization, and funding to help these low-income homeowners prevent them from losing their homes uh, or services to help um, those individuals or families who no longer have a home uh, and or are considered homeless. Uh, I encourage you all to visit our website, thda.org, uh, to obtain more information around those programs. Uh, I know it's a lot of information and we have a very short <laughs> amount of time available for us. So today I'm gonna touch uh, on a few programs that we administer within community programs that focus on um, our topic here uh, for this summit, which is evictions. Um, additional information around a few of these programs will be available for you at 1235 in the topical breakout session. So I encourage you all to um, 
make time to attend those. I feel that you'll get uh, more details of those programs within those sessions. Uh, the first program I'm gonna to touch on is the Emergency Solutions Grants. Um, as, as Ralph said earlier, um, THDA does administer the Emergency Solutions Grants. So we call that the ESG program. It's a federally funded program through uh, the Department of HUD. Uh, THD receives approximately $3 million each year uh, to administer this program. This year, due to the CARES Act, uh, THD is receiving 10 times that amount. So we are busy formulating a plan on how to deploy those uh, funds promptly. We've already put together a plan for the first $11 million of the funding. Uh, we're still working on the additional $22 million. If you're interested in learning um, about how we're deploying those CARES Act dollars, uh, please visit the THDA.org website and look up the ESG program. Um, but as a whole, the ESG program offers funding to help provide services to the homeless community, such as emergency shelter and street outreach. And you could see some of the other approved activities on the top right in that box. Uh, but a big focus has been placed on this program because it offers funding for rapid rehousing and homelessness prevention services which include rental assistance to avoid evictions and utility assistance. Um, I mean, there are other costs within those activities that are allowable like housing search and placement. Um, there's rental application fees, security deposits, uh, utility deposits and moving costs. And even most recently through the CARES Act, they've added a, a landlord incentive piece. Um, so this program, again, it's a hot topic because it seems to be like a great solution for a lot of the issues that we're um, expecting with these eviction uh, moratorium lifting. Um, but unfortunately, it's not everyone's saving grace. Um, there are a few requirements um, that HUD has imposed for this program that make it difficult to expend these funds as fast as we like during these unprecedented times. Um, there is a requirement that requires individuals um, who apply for this assistance to state, I'm sorry, to um, meet certain income thresholds. And they also have to provide um, at least for rental assistance, proof that they have no other sources available to them. So no resources like family or friends that they could stay with um, and or that they have to provide proof that they've uh, moved around a couple of times within the last 60 days or are living in someone's home or they have to provide uh, proof that they're at risk of being evicted within, the very, within a very short window of time. Uh, and with again, with the eviction moratorium in place, we are unable to document that risk of eviction within a short window. Um, and, and um, for that reason, it is creating uh, an extra hurdle for us to get a, uh, ahead of. So what we're hoping is that as we continue to finalize our plan to deploy these funds, that we'll receive further guidance from HUD on how we could get ahead of the evictions that are looming. Um, the next program that I'd like to touch on is the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. We call that LAHEAP. Um, this program offers utility assistance to low-income households, and THD receives approximately $70 million to fund this program across the state annually. Um, uh, due to the COVID pandemic, uh, THD did receive an additional $18 million, uh, which is going to be great and very helpful because this program is going to be a good resource for families that are being impacted by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, a lot of these uh, homeowner uh, or tenants households are at risk of eviction and are having a hard time making ends meet. So many um, households have lost uh, wages. And again, it's more important now than ever to ensure that they have access to basic living essentials like utilities. Uh, so this is a great program that again, will be uh, discussed later on in the breakout session. Uh, the next program I'd like to touch on is the Tennessee Renovation Loan Program. Now this program is uh, for homeowners only. It's not related to evictions. Uh, but many homeowners will be at risk of losing their homes uh, to foreclosures uh, once their forbearances end later this year. So again, this is going to be another great resources, uh, a resource made available to homeowners. Uh, it offers uh, funding to um, low income families for basic home repairs to help ensure that they could age in place and preserve their home. Um, and right now, the last thing we want is, is a family to have to choose between, you know, having to buy food or, or uh, other ex uh, living expenses uh, instead of repairing a leaky roof, especially as we get closer to the winter months, uh, it's gonna become extremely important for them to have access to these funding. And the last program I'm gonna touch on quickly, I know that we're very close to running out of time is uh, the emergency repair program. Now this is also another repair program, uh, only that is made available to low-income uh, households uh, who are 
have either disabled or elderly uh, individuals uh, living in it. Um, similar to the previous program, it, it offers repairs um, for low-income families uh, to help preserve their home and create more stability, especially during these unprecedented times. As you may be aware, the population eligible for this program are the ones who are going to be at risk of contracting COVID-19 uh, more than anyone else. So keeping them safe uh, and well sheltered while they're staying indoors is going to be extremely important, and we're happy to have this program available for them. Now, I know I moved through these programs really quick. Uh, again, I wanted to go ahead and put in my two second uh, commercial here for THDA. Uh, please visit our, our website, uh, thda.org. Um, if you'd like to get uh, obtain further information around these programs or details, uh, if you or if you'd like to email me directly, this is my contact information. I encourage you to do so. And again, the ESG program and the LAHI program will be available for you in more detail later on in the breakout sessions. Um, and that's the end of my presentation here, but I'm uh, open to taking any questions if anyone has any for me. Let's look in the, sorry, I'm looking in the chat and in the, <clears throat> Absolutely. and in the Q&A. And I know um, we have a lot of questions um, coming in in the chat and then also the Q&A. I do wanna just let everybody know that we are working to get those answered. So just if yours hasn't been answered yet, um, don't um, don't fret. We will be um, typing those answers and getting those to you. And then also um, we'll be, let's see, and then also we'll be, you know, answering through them and, and, and again, saving them, making sure that um, everything does get answered to, um, to the best of our ability. And we had, do have, it looks like there's a few, um, Cynthia and the Q&A, I think the very last ones that came in, um, Let's see. Something about this is a, a this program assists with hotel stays until appropriate housing can be located. So the, the ESG program does provide funding for hotel motel vouchers, so that is an eligible use. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of these specifics will be available later on today. Um, I don't want to steal anyone's. <laughs> But we do have a lot of great information. We even have an administrator of our program going into details around uh, how that works, how someone could apply, what's required, what the process is. And uh, obviously, once again, we're all touching on that hurdle for uh, rental assistance. We know it's of high need. Uh, right now, the, these are the only programs that are made available to help with this pandemic. Um, we're, we're having other conversations with in other areas to see what other type of programs we could put together to help, um, you know, all of the affected population. Uh, all service um, homelessness providers, if you haven't uh, applied with THDA to administer our programs, as we continue to develop, you know, that second uh, round of the ESG CARES Act funding, we're exploring all of our options. So definitely reach out to us and um, look up our information and see how you could reach out to us to see if there's an opportunity for you to partner with us to help us get this money out. Uh, I mean, our hope is to touch all corners of the state to make sure that we're providing assistance to anyone and everyone that uh, needs it that could fall within this program. And then um, someone had commented that you mentioned the ESG landlord incentive. Where would they go to um, your website to find out more information about this? That is part of uh, the CARES Act. It's an uh, accepted, uh, it's a new uh, allowed cost. Uh, more information uh, will be provided to them uh, once we deploy that second round of ESG CARES Act funding. Uh, right now with the first round, we uh, made it, uh, the money available to all the uh, to agencies that participated previously in our program. We didn't have clear guidance from HUD yet, so we wanted to make sure we made it available fast. Uh, so we went ahead and put it to use in the way that we knew that um, agencies knew how to administer it. For the second cent, we're going to explore other options and uh, more information on landlord incentives and how that could potentially work uh, will be available once we post that funding announcement on our website. So the thda.org uh, under the Emergency Solutions Grant or ESG. Let's see, there's a, uh, we may have one time for one or two more if you see one that you want to sure. take up. Um, and then uh, we can do in here. Yeah, we the, can do the rest uh, via. Uh, um, sure, and I could take some of these questions. I know they're coming in pretty fast. Yeah. <laughs> Only respond to them. Uh, a lot of these uh, answers I could definitely respond with fast because again, it's a federally funded program. So there are clear requirements laid out around uh, what type of documentation is used to support a reduction of income 
or um, to show how they are uh, at risk of homelessness within 14 days um, or um, additional ones on, on what type of claims are allowed or, uh, but, so again, we'll make sure that we respond to these uh, questions uh, short, uh, shortly. Great. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I, I'm just, I think it's been a wonderful um, opening plenary. I know I've learned a lot. I've been frantically taking notes over here. Um, and then I had to remind myself it was being recorded so I could calm down a little bit. Um, we are going to take a short five minute break, let people stretch their legs, refresh their coffee or beverage. Um, and then we'll get started at 1115 Central and we'll keep answering your questions that come in. Um, you know, we'll be typing our answers to those. Thank you all so much. Thank you.
Okay. Good morning. Er, welcome back, everybody. Good morning. If we have anybody who's just now joining us, we're going to get started with our second plenary session of the morning. Um, in this session, we're going to hear about different programs that are going on in different parts of the state and then um, uh, some statewide programs as well. So we've split it up into, um, uh, into grand divisions or regions, um, west, middle, and east. So first, we are going to hear about some things that are going on in West Tennessee. Again, please use the Q&A to ask questions. Um, you can use the chat as well, but to share resources up to panelists. Um, we are going to be keeping track of the questions we received and the chat. So um, if there's something that's not answered live or um, if we learn of a new resource, um, we will share it with everyone who's here. So I'm going to turn it over to our West Tennessee presenters now. We have um, David Cook. He's a sole practitioner in Memphis. And then after you hear from Mr. Cook, you will hear from Vanessa Bullock. She's the housing managing attorney at West Tennessee Legal Services. So take it away, David. Thank you, Anne Louise. Uh, I'm David Cook. I'm an old geezer lawyer in Memphis, a uh, native Memphian, uh, practicing 43, 44 years. I do more pro bono work now than ever, uh, though I've always tried to do it. And I think what we're doing during this pandemic demonstrates perhaps better than anything else that what a lawyer can offer that no one else can is the ability to take away the burden. And we are seeing that as we muddle through these hard times. Uh, I also sit as special judge a lot in Shelby County General Sessions Court. So I do have some experience with the Landlord Tenant Act, Uniform Residential Landlord Tenant Act. But what I wanna talk about now in describing what's going on in Memphis is the eviction settlement program, which was initiated in early June. It is funded by Shelby County government, which has funded $650,000, and also by the city of Memphis, which has provided $850,000 in funds. So we have a total of one and a half million dollars. Um, the money comes from the CARES Act through the local governments and it must be spent according to the CARES Act by December 31st, 2020. The program here in Memphis and Shelby County is managed by Memphis Area Legal Services, the Neighborhood Preservation, or Neighborhood Preservation Inc. and by the University of Memphis Law School with professors, including uh, Katie, who's already spoken, uh, students who are volunteering to do pro bono work and a pro bono clinic at the University of Memphis Law School. The program that we have here in Memphis utilizes Clio to keep up with what everyone is doing. We also have weekly Zoom meetings and seminars have been provided to the volunteer lawyers and the other folks who are trying to work through this project. Speaking of the seminar, I gave one in early July on the Uniform Residential Landlord Tenant Act and that is in the Dropbox if anyone is interested in it. Uh, and I believe you can get um, continuing legal education hours for watching it. So the Uniform Residential Landlord Tenant Act is not rocket science, but it's important to have a bit of a grasp on it as we try to help the tenants under these circumstances. Okay, the process for working through the eviction settlement program. It starts with an application filed by a tenant with Memphis Area Legal Services. If the tenant qualifies, the tenant is assigned to a pro bono lawyer who is probably working with pro bono law students. Essentially, what we do once the case is assigned to us is to contact the tenant, then contact the landlord, and then attempt to negotiate a settlement. I say contact the landlord or the landlord's lawyer. The status of the program to date, we have had um, 300, we do have 300 cases that are pending. We have reached 75 settlements for a total sum of $110,000. 
we have seen to the dismissal of 80 FEDs uh, because of violation of the CARES Act. We have approximately 40 pro bono attorneys who accept assignments and work through this. And we have about 20 volunteer law students. The total number of applicants has been 600, not all qualify and some are having their applications processed still. We have managed to get the six Shelby County General Sessions Court civil judges to keep the information, application information on hand to pass out to defendants during court proceedings. So they're made aware of the program and can file to get the benefits. We have also uh, gotten our six civil court judges to keep in the courtroom the moratorium affidavit forms. And those are passed out as needed in the courtroom. So that's been very helpful that we've been able to secure that cooperation from our local judges. In terms of the program itself, uh, not all lawyers, volunteer lawyers or otherwise have expertise in landlord tenant law, but participating in the program that we hear that we have in Memphis does provide pro bono hours which translate into CLE credit. The only requirement to participate in our ESP program is a Tennessee license. So if there are others throughout the state who might have some interest in trying to help the tenants in Shelby County, which has the most dire situation economically and with tenants of anywhere in the state, you can do so. And all that's required is to contact Danielle Woods at Memphis Area Legal Services. Um, these cases are not all that taxing because we get the the application information, which provides us with the background information. We then contact the tenant and the landlord and then undertake to negotiate a settlement. Uh, probably the average case would not take more than four to five hours. So it's not terribly taxing. And I know that many lawyers are concerned at doing pro bono work about their lack of knowledge in the realm of the law that we're dealing with. But we do have the online seminars uh, I'm available to try to answer questions or to assist, as are many of my colleagues. So we're very proud of this program in Shelby County and are doing good with it and hope that we will continue to do so. And trying to be brief and laconic, uh, I think I have finished uh, my part of this presentation. I am speaking again this afternoon, and if there are questions, we can address them later. So thank you very much. All right. Well, um, I'm Vanessa Bullock. I'm the Fair Housing Director and Managing Attorney for the Housing Department at West Tennessee Legal Services. And our agency um, covers 17 counties in West Tennessee. We cover everything that's not covered by Memphis Area Legal Services. And of our 17 counties, 16 of those um, are rural counties. So we don't have any great um, mediation program. I really wish we did. That sounds amazing and, and sounds like Memphis is doing amazing work for their tenants. Um, and what we have is a lot of spread out people, um, many of which are in bad economic situations and um, don't have a lot of housing choice in the first place. And so if they lose their housing, you really are risking um, being on the street for a lot of them. And what our office is doing and what other agencies in our area are doing are really pushing the collaboration and the education of individuals, both the landlords and the tenant. Um, so I've reached out and, and talked with our partners that we have always worked with traditionally about um, what types of financial assistance they can provide at this time, because that is the key. The CDC moratorium is imperfect in that it doesn't have an answer for the financial issues. And um, without that answer, everybody, landlords and tenants are in a very, very precarious situation. Um, and so we have received some additional CARES Act funding for some of our partner agencies who are now able to provide extended services 
and a lot of them have moved into providing utility assistance when they did not provide that before and that type of thing. And, and what um, the big thing for people to take away in our area is um, the Tennessee Homeless Solutions is the head of our continuum of care and they kind of manage the whole process. They um, create a resource directory that goes county by county and talks about the different agencies and the monies that they have. So that is usually the first place to start. I know a lot of landlords have called us looking for financial assistance. They think our office has it. We don't, but we do know who has it. And um, we try to keep updated with that, which is really hard, especially in these times when new money's coming in, it seems like every day. Um, but if you refer someone to either West Tennessee Legal Services to try to find that assistance or to the Tennessee Homeless Solutions, that's usually the best route to go. The other thing that we're really pressing is um, education and providing that education in many platforms, in person, virtually, on our website, because there's so many tenants who hear what they wanna hear um, and what they usually want to hear is I don't have to pay rent no matter what. And they're getting themselves into situations where they don't qualify for the CDC moratorium. They didn't lose income. They don't have any health expenses, those type of things, but they think they should. And so they haven't paid rent, they've used the money for other things and now they're being evicted and there is no protection for them. Um, and it's unfortunate there's nothing we can do for them usually. So it's so important to educate on the front end and to provide that services. And that's what our office is trying to do and working with the courts. We've been doing some clinics at local general sessions courts to educate the tenants on their rights. And I had my first one um, yesterday actually. And the reality is the majority of the tenants in court aren't qualifying for the CDC moratorium, but having somebody look over that and explain it to them um, really seems to help. We had, I think, 10 people come to us. Um, of those 10, five were being evicted for non-payment. Of those five, only two qualify for the CDC moratorium. Um, so by being there and educating them, we were able to keep people who wouldn't qualify from signing something incorrectly and potentially having some consequences on that end. And um, we were able to assist those who did qualify to stay in their housing and, and point them in the right direction for some financial assistance. So that's what's going on in West Tennessee. Great, thank you both, um, David and Vanessa, so much for that overview. Um, I think it's really important to learn about uh, programs that are going on in your area. And I'm sure people on this call um, also know of resources as well. And again, please encourage you to funnel those up to us. Um, we are, the panelists and I are always looking for um, uh, more resources that we can help, uh, you can help boost or and help re make referrals to. Um, we're going to hear now from, um, uh, some some um, innovative things that are happening in Middle Tennessee um, that also have statewide implications. And first, we're going to hear from Leslie Meehan. She's the director of the Office of Primary Prevention with the Tennessee Department of Health. And then immediately following Ms. Meehan, we're going to hear with Zach Oswald. He is the managing attorney from the Legal Aid Society of Middle Tennessee in the Cumberlands um, in the um, Gallatin office, I believe. Zach, if I, if I misspoke, I do apologize. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Meehan and let them um, entertain you for the next 15 minutes or so. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. And although I am in the Middle Tennessee slot today, I do work for the Tennessee Department of Health. And of course we represent work that happens all across the state of Tennessee. I am actually an urban planner and a transportation planner by training. And last night I was on a forum that was all about transportation. And in the Department of Health, we look at the number of components that any of us need to live a quality life and to simply be able to reach our fullest potential as Tennesseans. And we look at those components as housing, transportation, jobs, education, food, and access to health care. What's interesting is we've already discussed this morning the lack of affordable housing in the state and how our evictions are often related to the imbalance that we have between wages and the price of affordable and workforce housing. One of the council members in Nashville last night 
stated something that I, I know we have a, a vast majority of Nashvillians who are housing insecure, so more than 50% who are not able to afford their housing. But he actually quoted that you need to have a household income of $80,000 in Nashville to be able to afford the median housing price. I, I don't know, I haven't fact checked that, but I think it illustrates the point that without quality housing, we certainly can't have the other components of our lives. And that's really the premise that the Department of Health is standing on. If we don't have housing or transportation, jobs, education, et cetera, the other areas simply can't compensate. This morning, we hosted a coffee and conversation series. This is a six part series that concluded today. And we had each topic based on the, the ones that I just referenced. So each was on housing or transportation, parks and recreation, healthcare, those types of, of topics. And this morning's was education. And one of the things that we talked about is the challenge during this time in particular with unstable housing for children and how children simply cannot learn if they are suffering emotionally, if their physical health, if their mental health is suffering, and certainly if they don't have stable housing. So all that to say that this is very much top of mind for the Tennessee Department of Health. We have a, a couple of uh, solutions that we'd like to share with you. One is that we facilitate a statewide collaborative called the Tennessee Livability Collaborative. It is 18 state departments, commissions, and agencies. THDA is one, as well as many others who are on the webinar today. And the premise is that we are stronger together because we all have the same type of vision for Tennessee. We want Tennesseans to be prosperous and be able to live healthy lives. And we created something called the Tennessee Ambassador League Institute. This is an opportunity for frontline staff in the state to learn about one another's shops. We have incredible touch points with our Tennesseans every day, but many times we often only know what our own agency or department has to offer. I'll give an example of a nurse. We have clinics in all 95 counties, a little over 125 health department clinics. And in any given year, we are providing direct services to 20% of the state's population through about 1.7 million patient encounters. That's an incredible opportunity for us to interface with Tennesseans and hear directly about their challenges, missed appointments because of a lack of transportation, struggles with housing, struggles with employment. And so if we can simply empower our clinicians with the ability to listen to our patients and be able to refer them to housing resources, to job resources, then we are being better fiscal stewards of our state's dollars because we are helping to connect Tennesseans to other facets of, of government and really utilizing that no wrong door approach. So that Ambassador League is about to kick off its third cohort and we are training state employees from a variety of sectors and they're, they're all frontline staff facing employees. So they are working directly with the public. We really are proud of this Institute, very thankful to the Department of Human Resources who helps us to stand it up. And we believe it's a, a very unique state government partnership uh, in our country. Another effort that we've been assisting with is something that we've been calling the, the Tennessee Homeless Services bi-weekly calls. These were calls that we started back in March because we realized there were there was a lot going on. And so we have six state agencies, the governor's office, and a variety of local governments and nonprofits, all who are addressing housing and homelessness across the state. The calls are open to anyone. I can put some uh, contact information into the Dropbox. If you would like to sign up, we can put you on the distribution list. We have touch points with state agencies and, and dialogue between the state agencies and local partners every week. We found a few things. One is that it's greatly enhanced the coordination among all of the state agencies. Many of us have a piece of addressing housing and homelessness in Tennessee, and this gives us an opportunity to coordinate sometimes in ways we weren't already doing so. This is also giving us an opportunity to hear directly from the boots on the ground, from local governments, from nonprofits, from others who are addressing housing and homelessness. 
And so we can hear directly the challenges, their suggestions, we can coordinate and provide timely information around funding. And this has really helped to provide an open dialogue. In the beginning, we were very concerned with, of course, the spread of the disease and making sure that we were providing the best guidance around how to curb the spread of the coronavirus. Over the summer, we've been more focused on the tsunami of funding around housing and homelessness. And as we get into the fall, we are very much concerned with the flu season and how that is gonna coincide with COVID-19. And then of course, we are, are very concerned about the evictions. So the Tennessee Department of Health in summary is very honored to be a part of this work. We are uh, happy to provide any resources that you would like to see from us. And we just thank you again for the opportunity to be a part of the conversation today. I'm gonna ask for the opportunity to be honest and candid for a moment. I was tasked with reporting the resources out there for Middle Tennessee. And as I search for financial resources across Tennessee, I found it extremely difficult to find any help outside of Nashville. I'm happy to hear about the various funds that have been discussed during the plenary this morning, but if I was a renter trying to figure out how I was gonna pay my October rent this morning, I would be terrified. If you're a service provider out there, I implore you to elevate your visibility right now so people can find you. I know your staff is tired, overworked, and overwhelmed. I am tired, overworked, and overwhelmed. But renters, homeowners, and landlords are struggling right now, and they're asking where they can turn. They didn't sign up for this hardship, but we did sign up to help. This is the moment we signed up for. I'm glad that everyone here has signed up and I hope we use this time to create new collaborations to strengthen each other's organizations and strengthen the support nets that are out there for people struggling. With that said, for those who are looking for financial resources, I'd point you to the resources shared earlier by Donald Harris and Cynthia Parazza. I'd also generally point people to call their local United Way or to dial 211 from their phones to get to the United Way and who can maybe point them to um, the financial resources that are available in their specific case. People should also reach out to the continuum of care agencies in their area. And the lead agencies for the continuum of cares in Middle Tennessee are Community Housing Partnerships of Williamson County, the Metro Nashville Homeless Impact Division, Housing, Health and Human Services Alliance of Rutherford County, Homeless Advocacy for Rural Tennessee, and Chattanooga, Chattanooga Regional Homeless Coalition. Finally, I would point people to call Affordable Housing Resources and the Mid-Cumberland Community Action Agency. On the legal front and looking towards tenants who are heading towards court, the Nashville, Coali not, not, excuse me, the Nashville Conflict Resolution Center has created a program in Davidson County where mediators are available to help resolve matters between landlords and tenants. In addition, they've acquired acquired nearly $500,000 in funding to help tenants with rent. So now they can resolve your problem, then solve your problem. For legal help in Middle Tennessee, there are three main options. The Tennessee Fair Housing Council, the Tennessee Alliance for Legal Services, which has a call-in line for help at 1-844-HELP-4-TN, and Legal Aid Society of Middle Tennessee and the Cumberlands. Legal Aid, my organization, can be reached across Middle Tennessee at 1-800-238-1443. That number allows you to enter your zip code and be sent to the office in your area that covers your county. We've created a collaboration with Catholic Charities in Nashville to help renters facing eviction both in court and with the financial assistance they need to catch up on rent. If you're a community organization out there interested in creating a similar collaboration, please call me. Finally, I encourage people to look at the list of clinics legal aid has to offer people um, with one-on-one -on -one legal consults with an attorney. And the dates for those clinics can be found on our website at www.las.org. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Zach. We've had a ton of requests for you to post those resources um, that you listed. So if you can um, either do that in the chat or um, or uh, in the Dropbox somehow, um, but that, that request has come in multiple times. And I appreciate your comments about being um, increasing visibility, excuse me, visibility and that um, and being fatigued by what's going on. Um, I, I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, thank you so much for giving us that call to action. Um, now we are going to hear what's going on in the eastern part of our state. We have three staff attorneys from Legal Aid of East Tennessee. They all hail from different offices, um, Chattanooga, Knoxville, and the Tri-Cities area. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Michael Davis, Mr. Matthew Huff, and Ms. Amanda Petrie um, so they can update us on what's going on in their neck of the woods. Okay, I'll start off. Uh, I'm Michael Davis. I'm uh, the housing attorney, one of the housing attorneys at Legal Aid of East Tennessee. It's a pleasure to talk with everyone today. Uh, and yeah, just really have enjoyed hearing all the information we've got. And I'll really underscore what we just heard about uh, agencies raising their, uh, their visibility and getting the word out there because uh, it really is uh, starting to look like some, uh, that things are going to be very tough. They already are. Um, just a little bit of caveat. I'm a new housing attorney. I've been with legal aid since July. And so I may not have, uh, extensive knowledge of the resources in our area. So if anyone else knows of anything that I miss in the Knoxville area, please post those in the chat or the comment section. Uh, I will say, however, that I worked for several years practicing in social work and mental health before starting uh, uh, practicing law. So I do have some knowledge of those types of resources, and I'll be discussing a little bit of that uh, with what I'm talking about uh, and how those things intersect and connect and how it's, it's so important to be aware of those uh, to, to get people toward the right, right resources. Um, of course, the biggest news that we're talking about here is this pandemic. It's affecting just literally everything that we do. And uh, what I and the other housing attorneys in Knoxville are seeing is this rapid confluence of health, financial, and housing problems for our clients, which is a lot of what uh, our other previous speakers have alluded to. Um, and that confluence is amplifying each of those sorts of issues individually, which in turn amplifies, amplifies the other. Uh, obviously, this is anything new. Uh, this confluence of issues has always had a name, which is poverty, and that's what we're seeing happening now with the impoverished. Uh, what usually happens to them during a crisis of, of, of any sort, they suffer the worst and they suffer the most. Um, you know, to put that into perspective, say you have a husband and wife both employed with three kids, both in the service industry, both laid off. It strains the marriage. The wife has substance abuse issues, which resurface, possibly exacer exacerbating the husband's uh, mental health issues, possibly contributing to spousal abuse or child abuse. Perhaps there's an order of protection. Uh, then the wife and husband separate, are now behind on rent with major stability disruptions and are facing eviction and homelessness. This could be the first time they've ever faced this kind of problem. Uh, and one of those, one of the things that's different, I think, about this pandemic is uh, is that we have so many people that used to not be in the range of poverty that currently are. Uh, they can become, they can fall into that category extremely fast. So part of what we're saying, part of what I'd like to, to say is a little bit of a report from the front lines here about what we're seeing as housing attorneys, which I'm sure a lot of our, our judges on this call, a lot of social workers on this call are seeing as well. Uh, but uh, so we, we see new introductions of people that don't know these resources. So it's incredibly important for us to be educating people on what we can do. We can't. With legal aid, we, we have a lot of pamphlets. We do a lot of direct education with people, with our, with our clients. Uh, I'd like to echo uh, what Vanessa said earlier about stressing continued rent payment obligations and uh, the liability of fraud if you're taking advantage of the CDC declaration. It's an incredibly important thing for our clients. Um, and, but the cooperation with resource linkage, with knowing your community, knowing the resources out there just cannot be stressed enough. Um, we'd like to, some courts are doing a good job. Uh, it, we, we see varying degrees of getting the information out there, but announcing uh, ish, things that are available is incredibly important. Um, having printed materials available in court. Attorneys only usually get to talk to a few people, but the court can talk to everyone in the room at once um, if, if they happen to be running court that way. Uh, with the CDC moratorium, um, 
we've I think we've had a lot of talk about that here in in Knox County and the surrounding area. Uh, the United Way Fund has has done a, a great thing. Uh, people can call in to a, a 211 number and get help with and get direct financial help. Uh, they can call or also get in touch with the Community Action Committee to provide rental assistance. Uh, the Knoxville Community Action Committee, the Knoxville Community Development Corporation, which provides a lot of government assisted housing, extremely important resource. And I can't stress enough our mental health providers, such as Helen Ross McNabb Center um, and Cherokee and other uh, providers of that sort. This is just an extremely stressful time, and they provide a gigantic compo component to what helps people out to deal with these situations and get linked to other resources. Um, other support and uh, assistance. It's important not to forget about things such as meal services, clothing providers, uh, the usual providers for homelessness assistance. It's all incredibly important. But finally, uh, what I think is most important is addressing what the what the moratorium doesn't provide, which is financial assistance. We have to have some solution to that. Uh, hopefully, federal, state, or local money to help uh, stave off the worst effect of what we could be seeing of an overwhelming crisis in January. Thank you. Hi, yes, uh, my name is Amanda Petrie. I'm an attorney here in the Johnson City office. Um, thank you all for, for having us today. I'm gonna kind of echo uh, what Michael just said. Um, here in Johnson City and, and in the Tri-Cities in general, um, you know, with the moratorium on evictions right now, a lot of the individuals who are coming to us for assistance do not meet the uh, parameters of that moratorium. Um, so we have been having to give a lot of education surrounding that because um, a lot of tenants right now are being evicted for other reasons besides non-payment of rent or if they are being evicted for non-payment of rent. Um, you know, they don't meet those other prongs of the test. Um, and so it is, you know, creating a, a bit of a problem. Um, I do want to talk about a lot of the resources that we have here in the Tri-Cities. Um, one is the Upper East Tennessee Human Development Agency. Um, right now they have a lot of money. They are helping with um, deposits for people that are being displaced uh, or being evicted. They can help not only with deposits, but with first month's rent. Um, and so a lot of individuals who are really trying to get back on their feet um, that this pandemic has financially hurt, the Upper East Tennessee Human Development Agency is an excellent resource for them. They also have a, a program within their uh, same agency that's called LAHEAP, and so that stands for Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. That uh, LAHEAP will help people pay their electric bills because, you know, a lot of times we'll see people are struggling, they'll have to pick, you know, which am I going to pay my rent this month or am I going to pay, you know, my utility bills this month um, or am I going to, you know, go buy food for my family, that sort of thing. And so, um, you know, that LIHEAP is, has been excellent to, to pay those electric bills so then they can focus on rent payment, um, you know, or, or food or, or what have you. Another excellent resource in the Tri-Cities is Catholic Charities of East Tennessee, um, they also have a food pantry. They provide shelter for seniors that are in crisis. Um, they also provide supportive housing for adults with chronic and severe mental illness. And then they even have a home separate um, for those that are diagnosed with HIV and AIDS. Um, so they're, they've been an excellent resource right now um, during this pandemic. Another one is ARCH. Um, some of you might have heard of that. That's Ap the Appalachian Regional Coalition on Homelessness. Um, they have a program that's called the ESG program, which is their emo emergency solutions grant. Um, and that is an excellent rapid rehousing, um, you know, grant that, that will help people that are in an emergency situation that are being evicted that may, you know, they're literally having their stuff put out on the lawn. Um, they can call, you know, the ESG program, rapid rehousing and get them stable housing. They'll help with uh, rent and with utility deposits, same as the Upper East Tennessee Human Development Agency. Um, ETHRA, which is uh, East Tennessee Human Resource Agency, they also have LIHEAP um, under, their, under their wing as well. Um, I know that those, those applications for LIHEAP are only taken quarterly, 
um, but they do allow for crisis applications. And so, um, you know, if somebody's electricity has been turned off, they will still see that application, um, even if it's not within that their quarter parameters. Um, also, and last but not least, is the United Way of Greater Kingsport. They, um, at least for the Tri-Cities, have been a plethora of information and resources. Um, kind of what, what some of the previous individuals who have presented said with the 211 that they'll point you in the right direction. Um, that's the same, same thing with United Way of Greater Kingsport. They have been just an absolute excellent resource right now um, during this pandemic. And uh, just to kind of circle back to with the uh, moratorium right now, the what I have seen in court is if someone does um, sign and file that declaration, um, it's a complete bar that the judges, they, you know, they'll stay that out. But a lot of the they'll stay it out at least till after January. And then so the court date will just be reset to January. But what it doesn't seem like the tenants are really being educated on that we try to stress to them is if you like there's still that obligation that you pay rent and if you don't pay that rent it's just going to continue to accrue and you know it's going to continue to accrue back rent plus interest and plus penalties and fees um, and that seems to be the big thing that a lot of renters aren't remembering um, and so they're kind of forgetting you know yeah it, it pushes it out until January but if you don't pay, start making payments towards that back rent and get called up, um, you know, once this ends, you're going to have a major bill due and you're likely going to be evicted then. Um, and so we've just been really trying to educate people about that and, and to provide also this list of resources to anyone that, that comes into the Tri-Cities. So thank you all for having me. And that's about all I have right now. Hey guys, my name is uh, Matthew Huff. I'm in the Chattanooga Office of Legal Aid, and it seems like my fellow uh, attorneys at the other grand divisions have really knocked it out of the park, you know, letting everyone in this panel understand exactly what uh, is available out there for residents of Tennessee. And I was just going to speak to, you know, what I've seen in court and also some resources available in Chattanooga. I had court today. It was the 9 a.m. detainer docket. Um, there was over 80 matters on the docket. Um, it's, it's been, and we've had a large volume of cases over the past two weeks. And I'd say half of those cases ended up in defaults. Um, but, you know, my clients and clients represented by legal aid, you know, we were able to, you know, push their declarations through if they qualify for the declaration. And we were able to get our clients reset until after the order is over on uh, January 14th. Um, you know, I believe that the awareness of the CDC order is a great concern. You know, uh, most of these tenants didn't seem like they were aware of this potential uh, possibility for, you know, non-payment of rent. Um, and in Chattanooga, there's a local attorney who's got a contract and permission of the court, and she is just meeting with uh, clients out in the hallways to see if she can work with landlords to, you know, uh, to get some of this non-payment of rent resolved. And that's through a Chattanooga area enterprise. Um, Chattanooga Area Enterprise is over a million dollars. They're giving to individuals who meet their qualifications if it's able to, you know, fight off an eviction. And uh, that amount of money is also capped out at three thousand um, dollars. Also, uh, other options for Chattanooga residents: the City of Chattanooga, through the Mayor's Office, is offering rental assistance to renters who are directly affected by COVID. And of course, the big caveat here is, you know, you must be affected by COVID. You know, your job loss has to be through COVID as Chattanooga Area Enterprise, that's not necessarily the case. Um, other sources outside of Chattanooga and in the Chattanooga area are the Samaritan Center, the United Catholic Conference, Chattanooga Human Services, Metro Ministries, Family Promise, um, let's see, uh, Housing United and the Caring Place. And so, you know, not just in Chattanooga, but, you know, local areas, uh, there's uh, help that these renters can get. And of course, you know, renters can call 211 uh, if United Way is able to help them uh, any further. Uh, something our office is planning on doing is we're planning on working with uh, local attorneys, uh, particularly uh, one in, uh, attorney in, in particular, uh, we're going to set up a clinic um, where we sort of make it known to people in the community they can come to this clinic and it's a CDC declaration clinic where we kind of explain to them, you know, what exactly there's, you know, what exactly are they signing and helping them understand the penalties of perjury. 
you know, on a practical note, I believe the enforcement and the ac uh, applicability of the order varies county by county. Uh, in Hamilton County, the judges seem to allow tenants to be cross-examined, but once they submitted their declaration, I didn't see any judge or anything like that get possession to a landlord, and typically it was reset until after the order's over. Um, I had a matter sent to me from a rural county, and the rural county judge ruled against her because she was unable to produce any documents that she was let go from her job through her you know, declaration. And I'm really not so sure by the order they need to produce any proof. It seems to me if they sign the declaration and submit it, then uh, the landlord must seek all eviction actions till the end of the year. But you know how it plays out county by county, judge by judge, it's, it, it's a little uncertain. And that's all I have. Wonderful. Um, thank you all so much. Um, there's been a few requests while you've been presenting for you all to, um, uh, you know, post the resources that you've shared. So again, if you want to do that, um, you know, in the chat here, or if you, there's anything that you've mentioned that you want to share, um, you can add to the Dropbox. Um, we are going to keep those Dropbox links open for quite a while. Um, I saw in one q and I think it was that it seems we're missing a, a get out uh, get the word out campaign and I think that is very well stated so um, one of our visions with that with the Dropbox is for um, uh, to allow not only the panelists which uh, so far have been the only ones able to add any information but um, we'll open that out to those of you who registered and are with us so that um, if you have information on resources that you want to share that you think will be beneficial um, for the people in your area or across the state as people are trying to again get the word out about what they are doing innovative projects or existing projects that they are doing but also anything that um, may come up from you know an idea that is sparked today or something of that nature um before we have a, a lunch break i do need to make a few announcements um the first one is is that um if Please uh, stay on the webinar, this platform, for just a few minutes while you take a break. We've assembled um, a couple of videos on evictions, news story videos. One's a national story and one is a local story. They, they don't take that long, but you can just have that up and playing while um, you're snacking or stretching or um, doing what you will with your 30 minute break. Um, and then uh, second, um, to participate in the afternoon sessions, the breakout sessions, um, they are going to be um, not this webinar platform, a traditional Zoom meeting platform. So there's going to be a lot of us on there. We're going to be doing breakouts. It's going to be an, an exercise in, in efficiency for us moving people around to different sessions. Um, you'll be pre-assigned to three, um, to to a breakout room and then the presenters will rotate through the breakout rooms and um, if you do not get to hear a particular session don't worry um, those are going to be recorded and uh, the videos will be made available to you after the fact but um, to log into that afternoon session you will need to use the unique link you received from the ATJ info at tncourts.gov email address um, it is a, again, it's a unique link to you and um, that, that is how you'll participate in the afternoon. Um, I also do want to encourage you to uh, log in early if you can log in by um, about 1215. You don't have to have your video on yet. You don't have to, um, you know, be engaged yet. You can still be taking your break, but that will assist us in uh, making sure that everybody is assigned to it. Uh, a breakout room and so those transitions will run a bit more smoothly and then um, uh, lastly I just want to thank everybody uh, who helped us with this plenary session I know I learned a lot about resources in, in middle Tennessee where I um, where I live but also across the state and um, again I was frantically taking notes and um, am going to watch the recording and make sure that um, I am aware of everything that is going on across the state and um, and we will have all those resources mentioned for you we will again compile that in the follow-up materials that go out. I also want to thank the people who presented in our first plenary. I, I think it was a wonderful kickoff to the day and I'm just so appreciative that you took time to join us this morning. Um, and with that said, I am going to um, break us for the for lunch and uh, again, if you'll just stay
stay on this platform for a few minutes and enjoy some videos and then switch over to the other link at 12:15 central we greatly appreciate it